Welcome everyone to the second day of the Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning Workshop at iClear 2020. Um, I'm just going to begin with some opening remarks before we get to our main programming here. All right. So the Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning workshop is a five-day workshop being held in conjunction with the iClear Machine Learning Conference. We had our main workshop yesterday. Today is Energy Day, so welcome everybody. And we'll also be having programming on land use, climate science and adaptation, and cross-cutting methods in machine learning for the rest of the week. So how to participate today? It's pretty easy. You're, you joined the Zoom meeting, which clearly you've all done. Good job, you're here. Um, and then ask questions. Um, you can do this by uh, asking questions in the Zoom chat. Um, we will then, uh, based on, we will then select questions to be asked and ask participants likely to um, unmute themselves in order to um, ask a question. So I'll wait for instructions about, about that at the end of the session. Um, and then you can also, if you're registered for the main iClear conference, uh, ask questions or chat within the Rocket chat. If you're not registered, however, don't worry. You can ask questions in Zoom and your questions will be answered. Um, so for more information and relevant links about both today's program and the other programs coming up this week, you can visit, visit our workshop website, uh, climatechange.ai slash iClear 2020 underscore workshop. So our program today, um, one moment actually. Sorry about that. Okay, so our program today um, will have about eight hours of sessions. Uh, so we're going to start with one on machine learning for low carbon urban mobility, then one on the implications of COVID-19 for the clean energy transition and machine learning. One highlighting work on work using machine learning in the African electricity sector, uh, a highlight on cities. Uh, one on sustainable and resilient built infrastructure. Uh, then a session in which we will be getting updates from presenters who presented at our previous Climate Change AI workshops at iClear, NeurIPS, and AMLD, followed by a fireside chat on entrepreneurship, and ending with a tutorial on machine learning for those who are potentially coming from non-machine learning backgrounds. So this runs through the sessions, so or machine learning for low carbon or urban mobility implications of COVID-19, opportunities and ch challenges for machine learning in the African electricity sector, just flipping through these quickly. AI for cities, where we'll be bringing in uh, ECLA local governments for sustainability. Machine learning for the sustainable and early urban uh, resilient built infrastructure, where we'll be bringing in speakers from World Bank uh, and among others. Uh, these are the previous presenters uh, that we will be um, welcoming back for the updates block. So uh, work on buildings, transportation, and the electricity sector. Um, a fireside chat with John Bonanno, who's the Chief Experience Officer of New Energy Nexus, and who will be sharing his journey on entrepreneurship. And then ending with a tutorial on machine learning from Sharon Zhou and Sasha Lucioni, who are both members of Climate Change AI. So um, just to thank the people who helped put this together. Um, so there are a bunch of organizers, co-organizers, and also a program committee who reviewed work, uh, work for the main workshop um, and also are reflected in some of our speakers this week. Um, and also we'd like to thank our sponsors, Microsoft and DeepMind. Um, so for more information and relevant links, again, visit our workshop. If you'd like to tweet uh, about the, the workshop, um, then there, we have a hashtag CCAI iClear20. And if you have any questions or troubleshooting uh, that needs to be done, please feel free to email climatechangeai.iclear2020 at gmail.com to message one of the hosts or co-hosts in the Zoom chat, or also to, to message on Rocket Chat. So with that, I'll hand it over to the moderator for this session. Hi. Who is Lynn Cock. I'm moderating this session. I'm Lynn. I'm a postdoc at ETH Zurich. 
And um, this first session will be all about um, transportation challenges in the urban context and how we can use machine learning to mitigate climate change in this sector. And the session will be um, a less formal discussion and it's um, based on your input. So if you have questions or comments, um, write them in the chat window or in Rocket Chat and we will call on your name um, to read them out loud in the discussion part during the later part of the session. So we're joined by three um, presenters today by Kathy Wu, Konstantin Klemmer, and Prithvi Acharya. And um, Kathy will start us off uh, with a presentation. She is an assistant professor at MIT and part of the Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Institute for Data Systems and Society. And her work focuses on leveraging machine learning and control theory to build decision support systems. And she works with um, methods. Um, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, she works on methods um, such as sample efficient and scalable reinforcement learning, off policy learning, um, scalable simulation on how to bridge machine learning and control theory. Um, then we'll hear from Constantin Klemmer, who's a doctoral student at the University of Warwick and currently a visiting student at New York University. His research focuses on improving the capability of machine learning methods to model complex geospatial patterns. And he's also interested in applying machine learning to urban problems and has studied the spatial temporal dynamics of urban mobility and crime. And then we will hear from Prithvi, who's a doctoral student in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University, um, where he asks how regulators and jurisdictions can best utilize data and statistical models to develop cost-effective and convenient policies. Um, some of his current research projects include analyzing vehicle inspection programs, applying analytical models to study the effectiveness of these programs, and um, study how they may evolve with advances in technology. So we we'll start with Kathy Wu. Um, you can just click on share your screen. And there we go. Oops, just start at the beginning. Uh, can everyone see the the presentation screen? Okay, perfect. Yeah, it looks fine. All right. So thank you for the invitation, and I am very excited for this discussion. Um, okay, so I will speak for about ten minutes. I will. I probably have a bit more than ten minutes, so I'll just stop after ten minutes because I think it'll be really important to have the the discussion. So I'll be talking about. Um, the future and looking ahead at what machine learning and urban transportation uh, means together. Uh, so to, to really put this into context, what I'd, what I'd like to talk about uh, first is, um, is actually the, the concept of complexity uh, and, and how complexity really compounds the transportation issues that we see today and moving forward. There are a lot of different sources of complexity. Climate change is a huge one, which is causing extreme weather um, and supply chain disruptions, which just makes transportation issues that we already have a lot harder and even harder moving forward. There are also ongoing trends in terms of increased connectivity and automation with smartphones, with connected and automated vehicles, with the upcoming 5G networks. That all is uncertainty uh, and added complexity in our systems that they need to be taken into account as we address and think about transportation moving forward. There are also new business models popping up uh, here, here and there uh, over the last decade and we can expect moving forward. We can expect new modes of transport to be created that we, can, that we don't know about today that we may need to take into account in order to have a, a system that works well together. There are also international affairs, trade disputes, and, and so on that affect the, the, the entire system. So these are, these are, this is the context in which we have to think about transportation issues today. And it's 
tremendously complex. And so um, if we take a, a look actually at the critical issues in transportation, this is a report commissioned by the Transportation Research Board, uh, which is one of the national academies in the US. We can actually see that nine out of the 12 critical issues that they've identified are exacerbated by growing complexity, uh, such as what I, such as the previous slide um, in transportation systems. So I re I'll refer you to the report. I won't go through all of these now, but suffice to say that most of them are affected by this growing complexity. So now, now I'll sort of segue into why machine learning and why now. Um, so we, we have had, the communities have done, actually I would say a really good job in developing transportation methodologies, transportation systems design, uh, transportation modeling, forecasting, control, uh, over, over many decades. Uh, and I would say that change is now, ha has been in the recent history and we can expect will be so in the, moving forward that change is outpacing the existing methodology for reliable transportation systems. In that the procedures that we use currently to plan, uh, to, to plan and incorporate new information into transportation systems takes on the order of years. And we can expect these changes to take place in much, much, uh, much, much faster and, and multiple at once and, and so on. So I believe that there is a tremendous opportunity in, in data, in machine learning, where uh, a lot of the complexity can potentially and is increasingly captured by sensors. Um, these are sensors that you can place around the city. These are sensors in your, in your pocket. Uh, these are sensors. Um, and there's, there's also data that can be, can be generated and simulated. Okay, sorry, my screen just went off. I don't know if you can all still see the screen. We can Is see the fine? screen, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so, um, yeah, and so machine learning, this is one of the strengths of machine learning, uh, especially modern deep learning, which is extracting useful information from seeds of data and making and, and, and uh, providing insights. So now I wanna talk about one example of this uh, of the upcoming complexities in transportation. Uh, and the example that I often use in my work is of self-driving cars. I would love to see a similar analysis actually tailored to uh, electrification of transportation. So there's this, there's this technology that is exciting and upcoming. It's been exciting and upcoming for decades. And why is it exciting and upcoming? It can save a ton of lives. It can sa save a ton of, uh, of fuel. It can, uh, transportation is responsible for uh, more than a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, and there's a huge potential for increasing access to mobility. So this is a very, uh, this is one of the uncertainties, but also one of the opportunities in transportation. But if we take a closer look, and in particular at US energy consumption, we can take a look at where we are now. We're at 31% of uh, energy in the US is, is, uh, is due to transportation. And now if we look into the future, um, the year 2050 is, is made up, uh, but that is a number that is used oftentimes for uh, when we might expect to see full adoption of self-driving cars. And we actually see that it's a huge uncertainty. We could actually reduce energy consumption or we could double it. Uh, and you know, that's not, that's not exactly what we, where we want to be headed, uh, but that is where we, where we see things today. And why is this that there's such high uncertainty? There's so many different factors. There are factors that decrease energy consumption, which is what we would target, such as platooning, uh, such as eco-driving. Uh, these are sort of vehicle, vehicle di dynamic strategies that, uh, that reduce air drag, that reduce, uh, redu reduce um, uh, fuel consumption. But there are a ton of other factors. And in particular, there's this travel cost reduction um, that is a sort of culprit. Um, for, uh, for increased um, uh, uh, energy consumption here. Um, and so the question that, that really motivates my work is how can, we, uh, how can we deal with all of these different factors? These are each complex factors in, in themselves. How do we reason about them? Okay. And I, I guess I should say that it's different sort of linear combinations of different combinations of these factors that leads us to this 40% uh, decrease 
or 100% increase. And we just don't know where we, where we lie. So my question is, how can we, how can we actually view this as a, as a planning problem, as a control problem, and, and take where we are now and, and head to where we want to be? How do we, how do we think about this, this uncertainty? How do we think about this, this, um, this mixed autonomous, uh, mixed autonomy region in between? And how do we head to where we want to be? What might the path, possible paths look like? And that's, that's, um, that's the motivation. So, so the, the question is, how, what is the impact of autonomous vehicles on society? And we can say this for all of the multi, mo motivating complexities that I started the talk with. And so what we're, what we're working on is, uh, you can imagine a planning tool like this. You have a city uh, and you have some sliders. You have some outcomes and you have some, you have some field. You can imagine a, a tool that's a lot more complex than this. And the question is, with different uh, presets of, or selections of these sliders, in terms of say, the adoption rate of autonomous vehicles, that the, whether these vehicles are privately owned or, or not, depending on the city, depending on you know, the, the regional characteristics, what, what are the outcomes in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of the cost, in terms of these, these travel indices? Um, and now, uh, now this is all great, but when when we have when we set these sliders to something, how do we actually get these outcomes? And so this is where uh, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, comes in, which is, as we know, a very powerful uh, branch of machine learning. And each one of these slider, each one of these slider positions instantiates a reinforcement learning problem, which is how how we frame the problem. So we can imagine that we have some, some autonomous vehicles that, um, or, or a fraction of autonomous vehicles, and they interact with the rest of the system, which are the non-autonomous vehicles, the, the, the roadways, the signs, the, the, and everything. Uh, and we can determine decisions that the, act, that the agent takes on, which are uh, perhaps vehicle accelerations and tactical maneuvers. And the goal is to learn a policy that maximizes that some reward. So for instance, we might care about the average velocity, travel, uh, energy consumption, and so on. And we want to maximize um, uh, the weight. We want to optimize for the weights of a neural network uh, to maximize the cumulative return. So we've seen success in a variety of domains. And now we'd like to see if we can also see these successes in uh, a, a physical system that can allow us to plan into, into the future. Okay. So, We've done this for a variety of what we call traffic Lego blocks. These are simplified uh, pieces of the network that we've abstracted away from a real network. And what we found really surprising is that if we exchange five to 10% of, of vehicles for autonomous ones, we see a dramatic increase in speeds. And we also see a comparable increase in energy consumption uh, benefits. So um, just to return to this, we've, uh, we've studied at this point, very small slices of this problem. So there's still a lot to do. Uh, we're still working hard on this. Uh, and one of the questions that we're starting to think about is, if we move this slider just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, right now we're actually uh, learning everything from scratch. We, we will, uh, we will reinstantiate the problem and, and train from scratch. But there's actually a lot of opportunity for, uh, for a lot of techniques that reuse experience so for instance, transfer learning or curriculum learning. So I won't, um, I won't explain this too much. This is a slightly more complex network that we're working on, but I will say that what we are doing now is we are taking the experience that we get from a successful uh, ex experiment in say this, this bottleneck network, and we are transferring it to, uh, to related um, networks, such as the, the ones below. Uh, above we have this, uh, four to two to one network, and here we're we're transferring this to uh, a network with twice as many lanes, or a longer bottleneck, or we can even transfer to uh, to systems with different percentages of autonomous uh, of vehicles, so that we can reuse the experience. And so I'll just uh, thank all of the collaborators that have been part of this journey. Um, and as the sort of takeaway, machine learning has the potential to keep pace with increase in complexity. The main one research challenge that I'm very excited about, and I think is an open challenge for the community, is 
whether there's a limit to the level of complexity that machine learning can can support. Okay, and I'll just leave it leave it there. Uh, also, I included this because uh, there were, I think there may be some to this community. There's a very uh, um, high interest in in um, in in data, and so one of the big challenges in transportation is that data is increasingly privatized, which means that only some people or some companies have access to the information necessary to do a lot of this planning. All right, so I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, you can just uh, stop sharing your All right. screen. All right, thank you. And um, now we will hear from Konstantin Klemmer. Konstantin, you can start sharing your screen. That should work, right? Looks good, yeah. Okay. All right, so um, thanks for having me and thanks for so many people to join. It's really mm -hmm. great. Um, so I'm, I'm going to present, uh, rather than an, uh, more an overview, uh, as Kathy did, I'm going to present a, a, a paper that we just published in uh, ACM Transactions on uh, mobile networks. And that's very specific to uh, shared vehicle systems, which Kathy mentioned too in her presentation, that are kind of the, uh, the future of urban mobility in a sense, I feel at least. And um, this is joint work with uh, colleagues from the Alan Turing Institute, the University of Warwick and Tongji University. And um, we start with a, with a big paradigm shift that we see in urban mobility. Um, and uh, the, the, the biggest movements we see there right now is, is this trend from a, a privately owned vehicle, it used to be also a big status symbol in many countries uh, after World War II. And the, and the thing that people were pushing towards, like they wanted to to have a private a vehicle. Now we see a bit of a, a, a opposite direction uh, movement where actually having a private vehicle, it's not as prestigious anymore. In some countries it still is. And where it actually doesn't get you around uh, the fastest anymore. So we, we see a, a, a movement towards public and shared and decentralized transportation systems in cities. The, the second uh, paradigm shift is uh, from motorized to active. This is uh, happening also as a response to uh, pollution in cities, actually. So we see a lot of cities pushing for uh, more walkability and more cycling. Uh, I think a, a very cool example is always London. So London actually um, has way less vehicles in the inner city than they had 20 years ago, way less. So you would expect the vehicles to get around faster. But actually, the traveling time in central London for vehicles is so much slower because the policy of the city is to allocate urban space to bikes and to walking. And the last uh, big push I feel in urban mobility is uh, carbon based to sustainable. So you see lots more electronic vehicles and also the, the active transportation modes obviously uh, don't have uh, emissions. Uh, the last push is uh, the one that I don't mention here is of course uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, I don't mention that here because it is something that is happening like a few years down the line. It's not crazy big yet, but it will be soon. And um, as I mentioned in our paper, we look at one of the uh, most promising uh, new systems in urban transportation that is uh, shared electronic vehicle networks. Um, as you probably know them, Car2Go is a famous one and you will have them in almost any major city at this point. And the challenges for any shared vehicle system and for uh, EV systems in particular are all, uh, also some of the challenges that Kathy mentioned already, which are enormous complexities. So first we have a dynamics in time and space. So if, if we try to model these, these uh, fleets of shared vehicles, uh, we'll always look at uh, uh, spatial and uh, temporal patterns that are uh, really hard to understand. The second bit is urban complexities in general, which also means interaction with other urban processes like the built environment, where points of interest, where uh, lots of these vehicles are demanded and whatnot. Um, the third bit is a unique thing with, uh, with shared vehicle systems and that is demand imbalances. So you can think about that as there are some areas where people want to drive, but uh, they don't want to drive from there. So you, you 
you might have a lot of vehicles getting stuck in a certain area. And the, the last challenge I want to mention here is susceptibility to external shocks. This can be, for instance, uh, uh, events like concerts that disrupt the whole system or big infrastructure changes like a new highway that is built and the system that is existing for shared vehicles maybe um, doesn't, uh, doesn't work with that so well. So in our paper, uh, we, we show this quite well with a very fast expanding um, uh, shared vehicle system in Shanghai. So if you look at this graph, you can actually see um, the change in uh, car sharing stations uh, within one year. And it's quite astonishing how, how quickly that goes. And uh, it is really hard to find the optimal locations for shared vehicle stations if you uh, want to expand super quick as this uh, operator does, for instance. And the second big problem is that every new station you open might have very different effects on the system. So uh, in the top uh, and bottom row, respectively, you see uh, a newly opened station with uh, three different stations around. And you see that the new station has very different effects on the, on this, on the whole system. So on the, in the bottom row, you see a new station that is opened uh, on, an, on the other side of the airport. So where, where there was no station previously, and that has a very different effect on the system than uh, the top row where you just see a, a station in a central urban area. And so kind of modeling all these complexities is incredibly hard. So what we do, what did we try to tackle at first? It's a, it's a data fusion problem for the reasons I mentioned before, which is the urban complexity. You, you want to try to integrate as many urban data sources as you can which are potential predictors into your model. So you'll always have a very complicated uh, uh, pipeline to, to merge all, all these uh, urban data sets by time and space as they are available. Um, luckily, with a big push in the urban open data ecosystem, you have great open data portals now, and there's, there's a, a big movement of democratizing urban data. Also, uh, the keyword, uh, uh, citizen um, participation so that we can really use a lot of data there um, then the second bit is the modeling bit and um, here we use uh, graph neural networks to model uh, spatial depend spatial dependencies and we use LSTMs to model the temporal dependencies and we find this to work really well especially in the urban context um, and the reason why graph neural networks are, I think, so important for urban modeling is that they can deal with non-Euclidean distances. So if you think about the cities getting from A to B, you never fly like a bird. You always go by some road, and so you will never actually use Euclidean distance, but a distance that is way better modeled with uh, graphs. Um, and the other thing that uh, graph neural networks is allow, they allow bidirectional um, connections between two nodes. So if you think about one-way streets, for instance, in cities, getting from A to B might take you longer than getting from B to A. Uh, we test our approach on uh, the data set from Shanghai, as I mentioned before. And I guess our key results are that this combination of graph CNNs and LSTMs is currently the state of the art and the most powerful off the shelf method for modeling very complex spatial temporal urban uh, systems. Um, and the second bit is that um, this, the results that you get from that is actually very informative for decision making for an operator who wants to expand their system quickly, but also for uh, politicians who want to provide a good ecosystem for people to uh, build these shared vehicle systems. Um, I'm happy to uh, hear your questions later on, and if you have uh, any follow up, just uh, email me or so. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. And um, next up will be Prithvi Acharya. And um, once Konstantin has stopped sharing yes. the screen. I don't know how. It's, uh, <laughs> to the right of, well, it's the red. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry, never mind, I, I got it. <laughs> um, Prithvi, you can start sharing your screen. Does that look good? That looks good, yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I've learned a lot in the half hour that I've been here and I'm looking forward to staying for the rest of the day. Um, a lot of the work that I have been doing in the last couple of years has focused on applying statistical and data-driven methods uh, 
to understanding how vehicle inspections can be more cost effective for states and, and efficient for vehicle owners. One of the examples that I wanted to talk about today uh, was we looked at emissions inspections and found um, that gradient boosting was a very interesting and useful tool uh, that states could potentially leverage. Uh, so for some background, the idea of emissions inspection programs is for uh, states to ensure that not just new vehicles, but also vehicles in use um, are kept to the emission standards that were set when they were bought. Uh, this essentially requires that vehicles are properly maintained, catalytic converters um, are in place, things like that. Um, the primary aim of these inspection programs is uh, to mitigate emissions of hydrocarbons, NOx, and fine particulate matter. Uh, so it's really focused on local air quality improvements. However, uh, because badly maintained vehicles are required to be repaired before they can be certified as road legal, um, there are some indirect climate impacts, specifically that older and less fuel efficient vehicles are typically taken off the roads quicker because uh, repairing them becomes less and less cost effective. Um, and then also we know that there are indirect um, climate impacts from NOx and, and particulate matter emissions. Um, the idea of emissions inspections has changed very drastically across the world, most notably in the US, uh, where right from the 1950s, uh, states have sort of implemented some kind of emissions inspection where there is a probe, uh, they put the car on a dynamometer or some kind of a test rig, and then they physically measure the pollutants and in some cases carbon dioxide coming out of the tailpipe. Um, in the last 10 years, all US programs have switched over uh, to indirect measurement using um, the onboard diagnostic system, uh, which is a universal system that all cars sold in the US since 1996 have required to have. Um, it's basically a protocol that talks about data storage within the onboard computer and communications protocols uh, for how maintenance engineers, as well as people conducting these emissions tests can um, access that data. So the way emissions inspections work right now is that there's this battery of sensors in vehicles that are constantly feeding data to the onboard computer. Um, and when the onboard computer detects that there is some kind of an abnormality or anomaly in the data that might be pointing to um, either a wrong air fuel mixture or badly maintained parts, which might be leading to higher emissions or lower fuel economy, um, the vehicle firmware that I have represented here with a metaphorical black box uh, takes in all of that data and somehow decides at some point to trigger the malfunction indicator lamp or the check engine light of the car if the firmware uh, makes the uh, estimate that the vehicle is over emitting or, or inefficient. Um, so when you take your vehicle in for an emissions inspection, in most states, literally all that is happening is that they're checking whether your check engine light came on, which is to say that they're trusting this, this firmware black box to assess um, what's going on. However, the OBD system is actually a very um, good quality source of data because there's this list of about two and a half thousand possible diagnostic trouble codes uh, that, that are logged every time there's any kind of anomalous data. Um, so what we wanted to do was try and understand whether this indirect test method that was adopted uh, because it's faster and cheaper is really any good at um, identifying vehicles that actually would have failed a, a tailpipe measurement test. Uh, and thankfully for us, we got sort of a very clean and well-labeled data set courtesy of the US state of Colorado because they were considering transitioning from tailpipe to indirect. And what they did over a seven year period is that for every vehicle that came in, they, they conducted both tests at the same time, uh, which sort of gave us this uh, ability to compare and build this confusion matrix. Uh, whereas you can see the sort of two takeaways for me are that only 4% of, of all vehicles that came in uh, over that seven year period were found to fail the tailpipe test, which we believe indicates that they were actually high emitters, uh, but half of those vehicles didn't fail the sort of check engine light based test, um, which uh, 
indicates to me that there was some scope to improve the quality of predictions using the same data essentially that the firmware was using. Um, again, because the failure rate was so low, a lot of the results we presented here um, were based on a stratified data set where we randomly selected data to artificially elevate the failure rate to 50%. Um, I'm happy to talk more about why we did that and how we uh, checked for robustness after we did that. Um, so what we did essentially was collect data from these inspections and the inspection data included a snapshot of everything that was on the vehicle's onboard computer at the time. Uh, so things like odometer reading, vehicle make model year, and then also uh, this entire, entire list of diagnostic trouble codes that we then converted to binary variables for whether or not that specific code was present. Um, and then we applied a gradient boosted model to the um, OBD data to try and assess whether we could build a predictor of the tailpipe test result or the true emissions result based on this data and whether we could do a better job um, than what is likely being done in the firmware. Um, and we built a, a, this, this, great, this classifier that as you can see, um, when tuned for highest accuracy, um, had an accuracy and sensitivity much higher than the sort of black box test, which is represented by the, by the black dot there. Uh, our goal here was to try and give some more of the control back to state governments to say, uh, that they could then control and turn this dial, this, um, this receiver operating curve uh, to trade off based on their individual program requirements between uh, how much they wanted to weigh sort of false positives and false negatives rather than simply trusting a point estimate that is provided uh, in effect by the vehicle manufacturer. Um, I'll skip that for now, but uh, so one way that I like to visualize this that I think is, is interesting in this context um, is that we looked at, uh, so we built a model that would specifically try to identify based solely on onboard diagnostics data, whether a vehicle was a high emitter of NOx. Um, and within our data set, we had about 150,000 vehicles, which we knew from sort of ground truth data were in fact high emitters. Across that set of vehicles, uh, the sort of mean emissions per vehicle mile were about six grams. Uh, then we said, what would happen if we only used the existing OBD data, uh, which is the check engine light, and then if the check engine light came on, um, this vehicle would then be remedied or repaired. Um, and we found that it flags about 27% of all vehicles. Um, and if you repair them, emissions are reduced by about 30%. Uh, but that is one option. However, if there is this sort of classifier model with a threshold that state governments can vary, um, they could choose to set, I think here uh, it's set our model between 0.4 and 0.5, but they could choose to set this threshold such that they could flag more or flag fewer vehicles um, and still potentially have a significant emissions reduction. And I think this, this ability for governments to turn the dial is one of the biggest things that a public data-driven model that states can then modify gives this power back to the states. Um, I've talked a lot about air quality and I know sort of that is the focus of my research and not the focus of this conference. Um, but I think we still learned a couple of things uh, while doing this study that might be uh, useful and of context here. Uh, the first one is that all cars in the US and most cars globally though with different protocols have these onboard diagnostic systems that follow a reasonably common protocol. Um, and a lot as connected vehicles technology becomes common, a lot of these cars are also communicating this data real time uh, to OEMs as well as to uh, third party insurers in some cases. Um, and I think sort of this data that logs a lot of things about vehicle components as well as driver behavior because you're able to look at, at, at how they're accelerating and braking um, will then be able to uh, speak a lot to um, potential improvements of uh, sort of emissions performance and, and climate performance of these vehicles, um, especially because it's temporal data over a long period of time with hundreds of variables best suited to things like ensemble models that can identify patterns between all of that data. Uh, this of course comes with, and I'm sure this will come up again in the, in the discussion section, uh, sort of concerns of privacy and location data because uh, 
vehicle owners don't want these data to constantly be shared. So there's always uh, a requirement to ensure sort of anonymity and, and privacy. Um, the other interesting thing we found was that there are some fairness concerns in that the highest emitting vehicles and oftentimes the least fuel efficient vehicles we found were vehicles that were old and driven more miles per year, uh, which unsurprisingly was very highly correlated with sort of, uh, we looked at the median uh, income in those zip codes um, and unsurprisingly, the vehicles that were flagged as most likely to be high emitters were also in less well-off neighborhoods. Um, and I think this raises some questions around equity. Um, and then, of course, when with things like regulations that involve penalties for vehicle owners for specific individuals, um, I would personally argue that there's a need uh, for end users to understand how those decisions on what those penalties are is being made. Um, and I would argue that there's then some need to think about how we would communicate the science of exactly what it is that we're doing and why we're building and setting up um, relatively complex machine learning models in the way that we have um, to um, end users who may not directly interface with this model. Um, and that is as much as I had, and I am happy to participate in the discussion going forward. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, I think you can stop sharing your screen and we will transition to the discussion part. Um, we have a few moderated questions. Um, but please post your questions in the in the chat field um, at any time. We have about 15 minutes left until the next discussion starts. So um, the earlier you post them, the earlier we can call on them. Um, so first of all, I wanted to ask uh, each of you um, about methodological challenges that are particularly interesting for the machine learning community. I mean, you have highlighted some in your um, talks, but maybe you would like to emphasize some others or want to go more into depth about um, where there are interesting research questions around transportation and, and um, climate change mitigation for the machine learning community. Whoever wants to go first. I'm happy to go first. Uh, no, Kathy, you go first. <laughs> oh, are you sure? Yeah. All right, so I'll be brief. Uh, I think that everything is a challenge. I think there's so much to be done, uh, which is exciting as a researcher and less exciting as a practitioner, perhaps. Uh, so I'll just highlight a few. Uh, scalability is a huge challenge in our in, in terms of let's say uh, I'll, I'll sort of more focus on control problems, control and decision problems rather than like estimation prediction problems. So reinforcement learning problems rather than supervised learning problems. Uh, and so in the, in the control context and decision, decision making context, uh, the, the scale at which we can solve problems and make decisions is um, on the order of like one to four streets with like 100, up to 100 vehicles. Um, cities have hundreds of, have tens of thousands of roads and you know, many, many vehicles. So scalability is one. And so that's, that's sort of the primary focus of my group right now. However, at, even if we cross that boundary, uh, there's still so much to be done. So for instance, um, human behavior modeling is extremely important. And that, that may not sound like a machine learning challenge, but it is a challenge that, will, that the machine learning community will face along almost everything that uh, it does as as we introduce machine learning into the real world and in, interact it interacts with people so one of the major challenges is just it's really 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 difficult to model human behavior and so we have right now what we want to do is we want to design robust algorithms that can be robust to many different human behaviors right and so robustness however we want to address it whether it's robustness whether it's improving how we methodologically uh, account for human behavior, uh, and how do we uh, how do we integrate those models into into our machine learning algorithms? What, regardless of how we approach it, that is a huge huge open challenge. Um, and so for that, that's why I am very interested in like off policy um, learning. So I'll um, 
Uh, and then one last one is that I think is not addressed very much and I think very important is interoperability. This is the idea of as you create a new, uh, new system, a new algorithm, you'd like to introduce it into the real world, but you also need to be backwards compatible with the previous system that already existed. So how do you interoperate a new, a new algorithm, a new paradigm, while either simultaneously operating the old paradigm or be able to switch back in case you need to. And this is extremely important for adoption, for public trust, and for, and therefore for the ultimate, uh, for ultimately having a positive impact. So I'll stop there and turn it to Constantine. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with that. And also you had a really cool point in your presentation where you said the kind of technology is advancing faster than methods and that's a huge problem. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I, I want to mention three challenges. I think there are many more, but I think those are the ones that I thought of first. So first, I think in general, spatial temporal modeling is could be further. They're, they're cool advances in GPs, right? scaling GPs up. There's uh, graph neural networks, as I mentioned. But I think there needs to be more. And uh, one critical critical thing for that to happen is, is benchmark data sets. And you, yesterday you made WeatherBench the best paper. And I think that's a great choice because it's benchmarks like that that we need. But weather, for instance, um, if you look at weather on a spatial map, it, that, that behaves Euclidean, right? So whereas urban transportation does not. So um, even, even there needs to be uh, different approaches to different kind of problems, especially in cities with its complexities. The second challenge, I think, is a change point detection and kind of forecasting adverse events and so on that will disturb uh, traffic, for instance, a lot. This is super hard to do. And I think there's some cool, cool uh, innovations uh, that could be done there. And the last thing is uh, causal models for cities. Um, so as soon as you move into application areas like cities, I feel there, there has to be a bit of a, like people have to approach it a bit like economists do. There has to be a lot of thinking about interaction effects between different systems and what causes what. And so um, integrating kind of more causal thinking um, into, into urban decision-making that is driven by ML is super important. Thank you. I have nothing else to add, so I'll just defer time back to you to ask questions. I think there were some in the chat as well. Okay, yeah, we have a question um, for Kathy from the chat. And um, Lauren Kunz is wondering um, how you deal with the challenges of validating the environments and simulations and making sure that they're close enough to reality such that they can provide meaningful insights as opposed to just highlighting assumptions made when creating the sim simulation. Uh, that's a really great question. Um, so one of the unfortunate things about, or maybe good things about this research area is that it is a really, really expensive and time consuming and labor intensive to validate our experiments in real life. Uh, it is hard to ask a city, can we, can we, can we add a hundred self-driving cars to your city and drive them around? And can we conduct an experiment in your city? It's hard also to acquire 100 self-driving cars as an academic. Uh, so that is a real challenge. Um, I would say that we, we, so I can't say that we validate. Um, and I can't say that there are good, good validation strategies for academics right now. I think it may be as a company that, anyway, it, there's a questionable things going on. Um, I think that this might not sound like a great answer, but we just have to think really hard. We have to think about the experiments, the specific experiment that we're running. And we have to think through ways in which the, uh, the simulations that we run could differ when, when, we, uh, when we bring them to real life. I can say that our simulations are calibrated on human data, uh, but there are of course limitations to, to that. So I don't have a complete answer. It's a great question. Um, I have a quick question on the issue of autonomous vehicles. Um, since Constantine 
you mentioned that AVs happen a few years down the line, so um, you consider them not as relevant for urban transportation. Kathy, you're doing research on autonomous vehicles. Maybe you'd like to have a short discussion about that. Um, yeah, I agree that they are, uh, they are further. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, I don't think, I think we'll, I don't think we'll get a heated debate here on this particular topic. <laughs> um, okay. Well. So actually, okay, the, well, I, I can just say that although, although I, um, although self-driving cars does motivate the work that I presented and I do view it as a major source of complexity moving forward. We have a trillion dollar industry that's invested in making this happen and thus we really have to think hard about its effects on the system. However, uh, as I've gone through this research, I've realized that a lot of the insights that we've acquired, a lot of the, say, energy consumption benefits, speed benefits. Um, I'm also starting to look at potentially can this help with uh, air pollution benefits. But what I've also found is that uh, we don't actually need self-driving cars to achieve these benefits. We need vehicles that we can control a small amount. So for instance, a very good adaptive cruise control type system, uh, a Tesla-like automation system. So we don't need actually full self-driving cars. But the research is, so, so it's sort of a, uh, I guess what I'm saying is the, the work that, uh, that I'm doing turns out uh, if we sort of shift the perspective, there can be more near-term um, uh, applications as well in terms of most of the benefits that we that we expect to see which I think is actually really exciting and that therefore they may I think automated connected and automated vehicles is near term because they're already on the roads Michael. yeah just quick to why why I mentioned that in, in the slides is was more concrete to the case of our paper which is looking at like data of a system that is already in place and operating. I of course think it's super important to research the effect AVs will have. And it will be, like I said, it won't be far down the line. It just wasn't relevant for our paper. Talking about all the benefits um, that different approaches can have for transportation systems, um, maybe Prithu, you already mentioned that in your presentation about the co-benefits of climate change mitigation and other things like reducing air pollution, but there are also health benefits, noise, and so on. Maybe you'd like to introduce these co-benefits thinking to the audience. Sure. Um, so I think broadly a lot of the work that I have done has not just focused on uh, vehicle emissions, which like I said has uh, local air quality benefits, therefore health benefits, as well as um, sort of some lower uh, level climate benefits. We've also looked at vehicle safety more broadly, uh, things like uh, tire tread maintenance and stuff like that. And what we'd found there is not only um, are obviously sort of policies to ensure vehicle safety, mitigating accidents and road fatalities, uh, but there's some evidence to show that um, this also reduces um, congestion when, when vehicles are better maintained. And most interestingly to me, uh, in US states that have sort of some kind of safety inspection program, you're effectively getting clunkers off the road much quicker, which has this relatively large climate benefit uh, because it motivates people to, buy, to, to sort of upgrade their vehicles sooner than they would um, if those vehicles were not regulated. So I think there's a, there's a sort of client because vehicles over time have become so much more efficient um there is a always going to be a, a climate change benefit to um any regulation or policy that motivates sort of people to buy newer cars or upgrade their vehicles um but at least in the u.s context which is all that i've studied um i think it's also important to look at the uh, equity implications of any of these policies so i think there is there's a huge web um, but the interesting thing is that newer vehicles have gotten more efficient, so we should promote the use of them. Um, more globally, of course, sort of, and, and the other speakers have spoken more about this, um, anything that makes you drive your car less and, and sort of choose other mobility solutions 
uh, is great, but sort of nationally in the US, I see that happening much more slowly than I do as well. Okay, great. Um, we have three minutes left. There could be so many questions to ask. Um, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Um, there is a question from Chris Sankaran. Chris, would you like to ask? Actually, two. So maybe choose one. If Chris is here. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay, maybe I will pick. Uh, yeah, maybe Constantine, you introduced these questions about uh, the effects of shocks and also introducing new stations. Um, but I'm just curious whether some of the work you've been doing with spatial temporal modeling could inform either of those broader challenges. Sure. I, I, actually, the paper I presented does look in the effect of new stations and also gets quite good at modeling difference in these effects. And we do that by integrating measures like the like the road network around each station into the model. So that gives a that already gives a bit of a intuition on on how a station will affect the system. And um, so these kind of interactions you can already model. What we don't do in the paper is the effect of events like big concerts or so. Um, and then also uh, and like net natural catastrophes, catastrophes for instance. And um, that is something that we want to do in the future. Um, I am, I expect it to be really hard. Just leaving time for one more question, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, we do not have one from the audience. Um, so uh, one question would be around working with policymakers, working with stakeholders. Um, maybe some of them would like to share their experiences. Um, around getting our data, um, giving recommendations. Um, I will sort of second something Kathy said early on in her presentation is that a lot of the data is now being collected and owned by private sources, but we have got a fair amount of data that was collected by uh, sort of DOTs in the US and that was easy to procure. So I think, um, in my experience working with U.S. state DOTs. Uh -oh. Sorry, um, was I on mute the whole time? Part of the time. Just Not the whole seconds. time, just the last sentence. Yeah, so I think in my experience, as long as we've been very upfront about what we want to do with the data and we've sort of given them updates along the way, um, state DOTs have been, have been very, easy to work with in the last couple of years, at least the sort of five or six states we've worked with. Um, and more to my surprise than that they were happy to give us data, I think was that they were actually interested in trying to understand and then implement what, what we were working with. So that, that might just be my experience, but uh, I think the, the short version is, I have found working with governments much easier than working with private entities. And it is true, like Kathy said, that more and more it's the private entities that now have the interesting data. All right, thank you. With that, we are at, um, at the end of the session. And I wanted to give a big thanks to our panelists and presenters. That was a really interesting discussion and I actually learned a lot. Um, As so we can't have clapping. <laughs> thanks for having us.